Ladies and gentlemen, the Prime Minister and the Peacock will sign the Anglo-Irish Agreement 1985. They will then retire. The documents will then be issued to you. And in order to give you time to read, we shall resume the press. We shall resume for a press conference at 2:30. On Friday, the 15th of November, 1985, the British and Irish Prime Ministers, Margaret Thatcher and Garrett Fitzgerald, met at Hillsborough Castle in County Down to sign a document that became known as the Anglo-Irish Agreement. The agreement was presented by both heads of government as a way forward for Northern Ireland, a foundation on which it might be possible to build a solution. The day after the agreement was signed, the Belfast newsletter summed up the attitude of most unionists when it claimed that yesterday the ghosts of Cromwell and Lundy walked hand in hand to produce a recipe for bloodshed and conflict which has few parallels in modern history. Now, as far as unionists were concerned, came the greatest betrayal of all, from the pen of Margaret Thatcher. Here was the United Kingdom's Prime Minister offering Dublin a say in the running of Northern Ireland. Unionists no longer felt threatened simply from across the border and from an enemy within. Now there was the threat to the loyalist position from Britain as well. Unionist anger was expressed through a series of demonstrations, beginning with a mass rally in Belfast, which attracted 100,000 people. Where do the terrorists return to our sanctuary, to the Irish Republic? And yet Mrs. Thatcher tells us that that republic must have some say in our province. Ian Paisley later took his protest from the streets of Belfast to the floor of the European Parliament. I can thank you, Mrs. Thatcher, as a traitor to the loyalist people of Northern Ireland in denying them their right to vote on the Anglo-Irish Agreement. A unionist day of action was called. It succeeded in closing down much of Northern Ireland's industry, but the British Prime Minister continued to ignore unionist reaction to the agreement. As far as Margaret Thatcher and the Westminster government were concerned, the blame for the failure of more recent British policy in Northern Ireland lay with unionist politicians. Now, Britain had, in effect, sidelined the unionist community and was dealing directly with the southern government in a search for a solution to the continuing unrest. Unionists argued that this pact was a step in the direction of a united Ireland and renamed it the Anglo-Irish Diktat. The most important feature of the agreement was the creation of an intergovernmental conference headed by both the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland and the Irish Foreign Minister. This conference was to meet regularly to discuss matters of common concern to both governments. One of the main articles of the agreement confirmed the support for the idea of devolution, the transfer of certain aspects of government from Westminster to a local assembly in Northern Ireland. But the agreement also made it clear that any transfer of power had to be on a basis which would secure widespread acceptance throughout the community. In other words, any new Northern Ireland Parliament had to be one where power would be shared between nationalists and unionists. The Intergovernmental Conference was seen as a refashioned Council of Ireland. The conference was to have its own civil service, a secretariat made up of civil servants from both sides of the border. In fact, the Secretariat had already been established at Maryfield near Hollywood. This was one of the first places that Unionists chose to show their opposition to the Anglo-Irish Agreement.
We have always argued that the proper framework for making progress to peace and stability in Ireland is in fact the British Irish framework because all the interlocking relationships that give rise to the problem uh, can be addressed within that framework and only within that framework. But we're not under any illusion. John Hume, the leader of the nationalist SDLP, saw the agreement in a totally different light. From 1974, Hume had argued that there needed to be agreement between the British and Irish governments and between the two traditions in Northern Ireland before a solution could be arrived at. That principle appeared to have been accepted in the Anglo-Irish agreement. Two years before Hillsborough, the SDLP decided to engage Southern politicians in talks on Northern Ireland. This was at a time when Sinn Féin appeared to be posing a challenge to the SDLP as the main nationalist party. At Dublin Castle, two years after the hunger strike, Gard Fitzgerald called a special convention of politicians, but the SDLP had a hand in shaping the outcome of what became known as the New Ireland Forum. The original proposal for a forum came from the SDLP leader John Hume. He saw it as a way of defining what a New Ireland would be and what the role of Protestants would be within it. Gar Fitzgerald hoped that the forum would demonstrate that the future of Ireland would be built by the ballot box, and by the ballot box alone. Britain's failures hitherto have been our calamities. Our success now will be their opportunity to help us to bring peace and stability to this neighbouring island of theirs, and enduring brotherhood to the relations between our two countries. The Irish Prime Minister had invited all shades of political opinion in Ireland to present their views to the Forum. Those attending had to renounce support for violence. That ruled out Sinn Féin. But unionists refused to take part in what they saw as a nationalist talking shop. A year later, the report of the New Ireland Forum was published. It expressed the sum total of modern nationalist thinking on progress in Northern Ireland. The report of the Forum is not a blueprint for the Ireland of the future. The representatives of one of two traditions in this island cannot arrogate such a task to themselves alone. What we have together assembled is not a blueprint, but an agenda for possible future action. The ideas we put forward together show an openness to the other tradition in this island and a sensitivity to the preoccupations of those who belong to that tradition. The forum recommended three options to resolve the Irish question. A united Ireland achieved by agreement and consent. A federal Ireland, or joint authority, under which the London and Dublin governments would have equal responsibility for Northern Ireland. The Unionist parties were unanimous in their rejection of the report. If there was to be a peace settlement, it would only come from within Northern Ireland. In October, the reality of the Northern Ireland situation was brought home at the Conservative Party conference. The 30 pound bomb planted by the IRA exploded on the last day of the Tory party conference. It was designed to kill the Prime Minister and her cabinet. Margaret Thatcher narrowly escaped death when the provisionals bombed the Grand Hotel in Brighton. By this stage, talks had already been going on between the British and Irish governments, with special attention being paid to security matters. A week after the Brighton bomb, Mrs Thatcher met the Taoiseach at Chequers. It was here that she chose to give her reaction to the proposals set out in the New Ireland Forum report. That a unified Ireland uh, uh, was one solution that is out. Um, a second solution was a confederation of two states. That is out. A third solution was joint authority. That is out. The rift that developed between Garrett Fitzgerald and Margaret Thatcher after the press conference was short-lived. In early 1985, talks between the two governments took on a more formal structure. Both Thatcher and Fitzgerald had embarked on a path that would eventually lead to Hillsborough and the signing of the Anglo-Irish Agreement. Much of its detail was worked on by senior civil servants. In fact, the Prime Minister didn't consult the full cabinet until the ink was drying on the agreement. Some of her colleagues have since claimed that there was only one cabinet discussion on the agreement. The security issue remained top of Mrs Thatcher's agenda. 
She was convinced the agreement would achieve greater cross-border cooperation against the IRA. However, at least two of Mrs. Thatcher's ministers were openly critical of the agreement and of the southern government's willingness to hand over IRA suspects to northern courts. They believed that it wouldn't improve security in Northern Ireland. In fact, one of them later described Irish moves on extradition as a black comedy. And it was on the issue of extradition that Margaret Thatcher firmly believed the agreement would bring about major improvements on the security front. A year after the Anglo-Irish Agreement was signed, the Fianna Foyle leader Charles Haughey replaced Garrett Fitzgerald as Prime Minister. On the day the New Ireland Forum report was published, he insisted that the only solution was a unified Ireland with a new constitution. His position on extradition gave rise to friction between the British and Irish governments. To hand a citizen over to another jurisdiction is something that should only be undertaken with great care and scrupulous regard for all the circumstances. It is clear that at present many Irish people are questioning whether Dáil Éireann should agree to submit Irish citizens to a system of justice in which a large section of the community in the North has not as yet been persuaded to place its confidence. The handing over of IRA suspects at the border was more problematic than London had expected. The first two cases failed because of mistakes in the British government's extradition documents, and it took two years for the Parliament in the South to pass new laws on extraditing IRA members from the South to the North. The first extradition did not take place until 1988, but the number of successful cases never matched Margaret Thatcher's expectations. I think it must be a basic tactic, a basic principle of republicanism that we fight on behalf of the people. We fight because the people want us to fight. Jerry Adams, the northern leader of Sinn Féin, rejected the Anglo-Irish agreement just as strongly as the Unionists, but for very different reasons. He claimed that it would copper fasten partition and would ensure a continuing Unionist veto on any change in Ireland. Since the hunger strike, both governments and the SDLP had been concerned about going support for Sinn Féin. The Republican Party took 43% of the Catholic vote in the 1983 Westminster general election. On the morning that the results were announced, the IRA killed a British soldier in Ballymurphy. It was in that election that Gerry Adams defeated the former SDLP leader Gerry Fitt to take the West Belfast seat. Sinn Féin's new bomb and ballot box strategy appeared to be paying off. The government in London could no longer claim that Sinn Féin did not have a mandate. The British government, which is now a strong British government, have the opportunity once again to bring peace to this country of ours. This morning, a British soldier was killed in Ballymurphy. The responsibility for that soldier's death lies with the British government. The tragedy, the tragedy of Ireland rests with the London government. It appeared that Sinn Féin posed a serious threat to the SDLP. The New Ireland Forum, in its redefinition of the Anglo-Irish problem, was an attempt to diminish Sinn Féin's appeal for a growing number of young nationalist voters. The continuing influence of forum thinking lay at the heart of the Anglo-Irish agreement. At Hillsborough, Margaret Thatcher and Garrett Fitzgerald had effectively declared that Unionists no longer had a veto on political development in Northern Ireland, and that the Southern Government did have a role to play in any way forward. At its most basic, both governments saw the agreement as a joint effort to remove the argument for Republican violence in Northern Ireland. Just as importantly, the agreement was also seen as a counterbalance to the rising political appeal of Sinn Féin. In 1988, the leader of the SDLP, John Hume, took part in private discussions with Gerry Adams, as talks with Unionist politicians at Stormont appeared to be going nowhere. 
Hume argued that the Anglo-Irish agreement showed that Britain had no interest of her own in Northern Ireland. That message was reinforced two years later by the then Secretary of State Peter Brook, who stated publicly that Britain had no strategic or economic interest in Northern Ireland. The Hume-Adams meetings took on a new importance in 1993. Out of their latest talks came a mutual acceptance that the Irish people as a whole had a right to national self-determination, and an acceptance by both Sinn Féin and the SDLP that their view was shared by a majority on the island, though not by all its people. I would say to all of the Unionist people to read exactly what Mr Adams and I said in our statement, and in all our statements, throughout this whole process we have made clear that our objective is a total cessation of all violence. I presume everybody wants to see that. We have also said, following that, our primary challenge is to reach agreement among our divided people, an agreement that must earn the allegiance and agreement of all traditions. The Southern Premier, Albert Reynolds, had made his own contacts with Sinn Féin and with the Loyalist paramilitaries in an attempt to find a formula for ending the violence. He had to sell his approach to the British government. To Unionists, the Hume Adams Reynolds approach was a conspiracy. However, James Molyneux realized that in a situation free from violence, Unionists and those who in the past supported the paramilitaries would have to engage in talks. When fellow travelers end their exploitation, intimidation, and racketeering, and all arms are, and explosives are surrendered, then there will be a lengthy period of quarantine before access to the democratic processes can be even considered. As Unionists considered the new politics emerging on the Nationalist side, John Major and Albert Reynolds delivered a new framework for Northern Ireland, the Downing Street Declaration. The Taoiseach and I have now agreed on a joint declaration on Northern Ireland. It is a declaration for democracy and dialogue, and it is based on consent. It makes no compromise on strongly held principles, but it does embody a common view that there is an opportunity to end violence for good in Northern Ireland. This is a historic opportunity for peace. We hope that everybody will grasp it. There is now a clear political path which is meaningful for all. What we are offering is a framework for peace that prejudices nobody's position or predetermines nobody's future. Peace should be the starting point for our new beginning. Thank you. The press conference will be in around half an hour. I would hope Here, in a sense, was the Anglo-Irish Agreement Mark II, only this time without the furious reaction of 1985. Although the DUP's Ian Paisley denounced it as another sellout to Dublin, the main unionist party under James Molyneux was prepared to give it a hearing and to consider its implications. The Downing Street Declaration accepted what it described as the right of the Irish people to self-determination exercised respectively. That was welcomed by the SDLP, but as far as the Republican movement was concerned, the British and Irish governments were giving two different interpretations of the Declaration. On the one hand, the Irish government emphasised the right of nationalists to work for a united Ireland. On the other hand, Britain highlighted the Unionist case with a heavily qualified guarantee that Northern Ireland's constitutional position could not change without the consent of a majority. The declaration was to lead to a split between Ian Paisley and the Ulster Unionist Party. James Molyneux had been consulted by John Major at all stages of the process. He insisted that the declaration was simply a statement of principles for future movement. It also enshrined the doctrine of consent. As far as Sinn Féin was concerned, the different emphasis that the two governments put on the Downing Street Declaration was not a solid basis for selling it to the IRA as a way of ending violence. Sinn Féin began a process of consultation with party members around the country to test opinion on the Declaration. 
This culminated in a party conference at Letterkenny in County Donegal in July, when Sinn Féin delegates formally rejected the Downing Street Declaration. Despite the conference's rejection of the declaration, Jerry Adams spoke in conciliatory terms to both governments as he addressed party members in his closing speech. From their perspective, the declaration was an important development. From our perspective, it marked a stage in the evolving peace process. In its positive elements, it suggests a potentially significant change in the approach of the governments to resolving the conflict in Ireland, and we welcome this. But it does not deal adequately with some of the core issues, and this is crucial. Adams was determined to maintain his dialogue with the southern government. Albert Reynolds believed that the Sinn Féin leader was seriously attempting to persuade the IRA Army Council that an opportunity existed to end the violence and to begin talking. It was these contacts which led to the IRA ceasefire in August 1994. It's just been announced that from midnight tonight, the leadership of the IRA have decided that as of midnight, August the 31st, there will be a complete cessation of military operations. They say that all our units have been instructed accordingly. At this historic crossroads, the leadership of the IRA salute and commend our volunteers. There will be a fuller bulletin at 12 o'clock. BBC Radio Ulster News. I want to salute the courage of the IRA leadership and the historic and bold and decisive initiative that they have taken and which they announced this morning. They have created, if you like, a crucial moment, a decisive moment in the history of this island and of Anglo-Irish relationships. And I, I applaud and I commend the leadership of the army, but I also applaud and commend you, you people here today and others who could not be here because you also are undefeated by 25 years. The British government and unionist politicians criticized the absence of the word permanent from the ceasefire statement and demanded that Sinn Féin explain if the complete end to military operations meant a permanent end. They wanted to be sure that the violence had finished for good before Sinn Féin would be admitted to talks. The British government was slow to react to the ceasefire announcement, but the Irish government and the SDLP accepted that the ceasefire was for good. The following month, the Taoiseach, Albert Reynolds, the leader of the SDLP, John Hume, and the president of Sinn Féin, Gerry Adams, met at government buildings in Dublin to open dialogue on a way forward. On the 12th of October, the Loyalist paramilitaries also announced a ceasefire. They insisted that this would depend on the IRA honouring its end to violence. And in the belief that the democratically expressed wishes of the greater number of people in Northern Ireland will be respected and upheld, the combined Loyalist military command will universally cease all operational hostilities as from 12 midnight on Thursday, the 13th of October, 1994. I call upon the Taoiseach, Deputy That Albert month, Renner. the Irish government established a forum for peace and reconciliation in the Republic. All shades of political opinion on the island were present, with the exception of the Unionists, who turned down their invitation. One of the key aims of the forum was to bring Sinn Féin into the political process as soon as possible after the ceasefire. Today's inaugural meeting within a few weeks of the two ceasefires represents a further important step on the road to a just and a lasting peace. No one should be in any doubt about the value of this forum or of the importance of its work. The establishment of the Forum for Peace and Reconciliation was a key commitment by the Irish government 
set out in the joint peace declaration. On the same day the Loyalists announced their ceasefire, the British government stated that it would make a working assumption that the IRA ceasefire was for good and that it would begin talks with Sinn Féin before Christmas. On the 9th of December, a Sinn Féin delegation, which included people who had been convicted of IRA offences and served terms of imprisonment, arrived at Stormont for talks with British government officials. Six days later, representatives of the Loyalist paramilitaries made their way into Parliament buildings at Stormont. These delegations also included people who had served terms of imprisonment. The government insisted that these were only exploratory talks. Meantime, the two governments had hoped to agree a framework for progress before Christmas 1994. A crisis in Dublin, however, brought down Albert Reynolds' government. As a result, the negotiations on a framework for progress were not completed until February. On the 22nd, the new Taoiseach John Bruton and John Major met in Belfast to present what they hoped would be the basis for an overall settlement in Ireland. The process would have three strands. It would seek a new beginning for relationships within Northern Ireland, relations between the North and the South of the island of Ireland, and relations between the United Kingdom and the Republic. We agreed that it was only by addressing all these relationships together that agreement would be found across the community in Northern Ireland. At this press conference, the Taoiseach and I are publishing the document a new framework for agreement, which deals with the second and the third of these strands. A little later this morning, I will return to this conference hall and put forward a separate document proposing new arrangements within Northern Ireland. That is, of course, a matter for the British government and the Northern Ireland parties alone. There was an immediate outcry from Unionists against the framework document. To them, it had been inspired by the Hume-Adams talks. But Britain maintained that Unionist interests had been accommodated. There could be no change in Northern Ireland without the consent of a majority. It appeared that the London and Dublin governments envisaged a settlement which would require Unionists and Nationalists to rethink their relationships within Northern Ireland, within the whole island of Ireland and with Britain. Once the gun had been taken out of Northern Ireland politics, it was hoped a lasting agreement could be achieved.